We're here in Philippians chapter 1 today. And uh, let me lead us in a word of prayer and we'll jump right into things. Father in heaven, mindful again today of your goodness and your faithfulness and the word of God. And good to be reminded of these things. And thank you, Lord, for the good music that we've enjoyed, the choir number and congregational. And now listening to Brother Peter sing uh, prepares our heart, Lord, for the word of God, the truth of God. Lord, give us today a heart that is open and an ear that is prepared to receive what you would have for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Philippians is a fantastic book. I love it. I have to chart my sermons, and I do. I, I keep a track of where I've been because I find myself wanting to go to the book of Philippians over and over and over again. I love it. I love it. Oh, it's a good letter. It's a letter that's full of truth. How many of you save letters that people have written you in the past? My wife has put away the letters that I wrote to her when we were dating. I like you. Do you like me? Her response, hit the street, man. No. I've shared this with you before. I uh, told my wife after we had been seeing each other for some time in college, I said to her, I love you. And she looked at me. I, of course, was expecting in return, I love you, and I didn't get that in return. She may have said, I like you, I'm fond of you, I think you're neat. I, I don't know what she said, but I thought, well, that's, that's kind of a, you know, and so, uh, you know, I thought, well, maybe she just didn't hear me. <laughs> so a little while later, I said it again. You know, I was going to make it real casual, you know, as we were departing, you know, hey, I love you. I said it again, no response. And then one day, I received a little note on a piece of pink paper, and it said, I love you too, with a little flower. And I took that, and I went to work that day. And I sat in my desk there, and the guys there at work who, you know, were older and men of the world could not understand why in the world I was so ecstatic to have received this little note from this gal. And I got the old hillbilly laminate. You know what hillbilly lamination is, don't you? It's called scotch tape, right? And I, like I did my Social Security card, I laminated that note, and I carried that note around and still have it somewhere. I'm thinking about it, but I lose a lot of things these days, okay? I, I climbed in the wrong car the other day. I got in, and it was, surprisingly, it was clean, and I thought, this is not my truck. <laughs> I'm in the wrong vehicle. So, but I've got that note. We pull that note out. You know, I wrote notes and letters as a child to grandparents, and I would go and visit them, and I would see that they kept those as well. And sometimes we put those things in, in boxes, right? I've got in my library books that are letters that were written by fathers to sons or letters to other people and compiled. We learn a lot by reading a letter. We see the heart of things. One of the things we've lost in our society, we're quick in our response. We text. Text messages can be deleted. Text messages can be misunderstood, right, very quickly. And then now we're using hieroglyphics. We've reverted back, right, to the times. You were sending smiley faces now. And uh, I can't always interpret what those things mean, but I, I think they're positive when I receive those messages. But there's something about a letter. The book of Proverbs talks about receiving a letter, receiving good news from a far country and how that encourages. Remember what it was like, old timers, when you went to the mailbox and there was a letter in the mailbox from somebody? And my wife and I were dating. They, I would send her letters and she would write me letters over the summertime and they would come through the mail. That was a big deal to get that letter. Hold on to that letter. You have uh, God's letters to you. The Lord used a man by the name of the Apostle Paul to write letters to churches. And the Spirit of God moved him and gave him the words. And he wrote to different groups of folks. And those letters are called epistles. There are some that are pastoral epistles. That's a letter that the Lord used the Apostle Paul to write to preachers like Timothy and to Titus. There are letters that others wrote too that are called general epistles or general letters. But we're looking now into a collection of letters in the Bible that the Lord used Paul to send to these local churches. They're called prison letters or prison epistles. They're at a time in the Apostle Paul's life where he was in bond. You read about it a moment ago when you looked in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. He's giving explanation to this church in Philippi of why he's in jail, why he's in bonds. You know, so oftentimes we'll read the Bible, and if we're not careful, we don't actually think about what's going on to the person who's being used to write that. And oftentimes we don't think what's going on in the lives of the people who are receiving that. Somebody has entrusted to me over the years various artifacts. I have a little bit of a collection in the lobby of the gymnasium of some military artifacts. 
I've got some New Testaments, for example, that were passed out to soldiers in World War II. One of those has got a metal plate on the front of it for them to carry over their heart. And that metal plate on occasion saved people's lives there as bullets would graze off or shrapnel and things of that nature. I've got some war rationing stamps that somebody shared with me. I've got medals that folks have given to me that their loved ones earned on display. One of the things that I have, and I keep it put up, was a letter that somebody had written home. It was a letter from a son back to the family. Just a general letter, just saying how people were doing and what was going on. And for years, that family held on to that letter. It had great significance to them because of where that person was at at the time and the fact that they were thinking about them. When you read the book of Philippians, you ought to put just a little bit of thought and a little bit of time into what's going on in the life of the Apostle Paul and what's going on in the church in Philippi, and it makes the Bible come alive to us. So oftentimes we've heard what the world says about the Bible, and that's an a, a unspiritual and a carnal approach. They discredit the Bible. They discredit the authority of the Bible. They discredit the inspiration of the Bible. But that's nothing new. You see, that's the very first tactic that Satan introduced in the garden. When he came to Eve, he said to Eve, Yea, hath God said. All man has been working against the word of God, and the devil has been working against the man of God since the beginning. And you and I need to be a people who not only believe in the Bible, but a people who study the Bible and have a heart for the word of God. This is not the message, but I'll just put this out here. If today all of our Bibles were taken from us, if everybody in here lost their Bible, if there was a seizure of our Bibles, and we all came together and we said, okay, everybody regurgitate the verses that you've memorized, how much of the Bible would we be able to commit to paper? The psalmist said, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not, what, sin against thee. We have such a strong opinion of God's Word, but I'm afraid at times, practically, we just don't have scheduled and or structured time or approach to God's Word. And here we see a letter. Much like you and I might go and sift through the memories of another and pull that letter out. Here is a letter that is written to the church in Philippi, but it's contained in the Word of God, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means everything you read in Genesis, everything you read in Exodus, every detail about the people of Israel, the characters of the Bible, everything about the Bible is for you, even though it's not always about you or to you, but it's always for you. You ought to be well versed in the Scripture. That's why when we come to church, we ought to open our Bibles. That's why we want you to have a Bible. If you don't, it would be my my greatest pleasure today to give you a nice Bible for you to take home and to be able to have for yourself and to read and to be encouraged to do so. We want you to have a Bible. We want you to have a desire for God's Word. Like that prophet who said, well, when I eat God's Word, it's like, a, it's like honey. It's like a dessert to me. It's like a chocolate chip cookie, amen? I like it, and we want to have that. So we should have the Bible in church. We should have the Bible in Sunday school. We should be opening the Bible and be in the habit of coming to God's Word. Why? It's God helping us. And this letter that was received by the church in Philippi, given to them through the Lord's vessel, the Apostle Paul, was going to address a few things. Number one, it was a, a letter to make sure that they had a good understanding of one of their brothers, a fellow by the name of Ephroditus, who had been sent by them to help the Apostle Paul out. He wanted to make sure that he still had a good reputation with those people in that church and to know that he had been very sick and that he had recovered and that he had done the job that he was called to do. Why, just moving past that very quickly, reputation and being careful of people's reputation is an important thing. We've become a society that's far too slanderous and far too quick to say things and to be injurious to other people's testimony. And building on our message last week of a building block, a stumbling block, or a roadblock, one of the ways that we can impact and hurt people negatively is if we're too far too critical or too assuming in the things that we say regarding others. It can cause someone to stumble and to trip up. We need to be careful with that. I'm not suggesting cover-up. I'm not suggesting that we're dishonest or uh, disingenuous. Not at all. But, you know, there are some things that simply don't have to be told to everybody. There are some things that do not affect the whole. And you know, there are some times when you have an opinion and I have an opinion of somebody and it's one-sided. 
We should be careful with that. And the Apostle Paul wanted the people to know. He even gave specific in chapter 2, the conclusion of it. He gave specific information about this man and how he had been a blessing to them and how he had been sent by them and how he had given himself to the work of God. You know, it's right for us to have a high opinion of God's people. It's right for us to appreciate those who minister around us. It's right for you to think highly of your Sunday school teacher. Oh, it's not to worship them or to have some false sense of anything because the reality is any of us are what we are by the grace of God. That's all we are. But there is something when we tear down that appreciation for people who are pulling us in the right direction, when we tear that down, then who do we have to look to? I mentioned at the 9 o'clock service, it's amazing to me how a professional athlete can do just about anything they want and still be well thought of in communities. They can have posters published of them. People actually sign up to get a picture of the person. The guy can be a total clown in life. And then we're so quick to be uh, callous or not careful in being respectful and being appreciative of those that are around us. We need to, as a society, we really need to know those people that we should look to. The Apostle Paul was never trying to get people to follow him over Christ. He was saying to them, what? Follow me as I follow Christ. And so as we see people following the Lord, that's good for us. That helps us. And this man that had been sent there from them had done a good job. Number two, he wanted to tell them thank you. So I just want to tell you thank you. Four occasions here he'll thank them for things that they had done. Because not only in the book of Philippians, but in other portions of Scripture do we see where this church and this church in Philippi was mentioned as being people who were gracious and who were giving. Not only had they given of gifts, but they also sent they sent somebody to go and to help and be a blessing to the Apostle Paul. Just moving past that, but we should be a giving and ascending church. We should be mindful of this. There was also something evidently in chapter 4 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul has directs them that there's a couple of ladies that are having a problem with each other. He said, hey, you two, get this thing figured out and get on board here and be unified in Christ. Stop your squabbling. You know what becomes really uncomfortable for people? is when others have their issue that goes unresolved. People don't know what to say or where to stand on it or how to act around it. And those things need to be cared for. They need to be resolved. If it's something that you can simply go to the Lord and say, Lord, give me victory over this, then get victory over it. And so oftentimes I find my squabble with others when I spend time in the presence of Jesus. I can run to the book of Ephesians and be kind and be tenderhearted and be forgiving, walk in wisdom, know how to go forward in the relationship, but not carrying that. Hey, go to a family get-together where there's people who obviously have a problem with each other. Come into a church where there's a consistent pattern of people having a problem with each other. And you know what? You pick up on it real quick. And evidently in this church, which was a giving, serving church, who had people who loved the Lord, who were developing, there was room for contention. And in this passage, it's ladies, but I want to tell you something. I've been around some quarrelsome men, too. And that can be just as uncomfortable. And he said, hey, we're in Christ. And so you're going to see over 20 times in the book of Philippians, the expression in Christ, in the Lord, is going to be emphasized because that's our position. And your position ought to affect your disposition. Let me say that again. Your position ought to affect your disposition. Amen. This is why the book of Philippians deals with in the Lord, in Christ. It's why there's joy in the book of Philippians. There's service in the book of Philippians because that's all about Jesus and who Jesus is. Now the great thing is that out of that conflict between those two, there comes good teaching. Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The expression about service and serving and having that unity, that comes from that platform and that development of people having problems. You know the wonderful thing about problems in our life and other people's lives is they become a learning experience for us. Right? You see somebody say something and they get slapped upside the head, then you realize, I'm not going to say that because I don't want to get slapped upside the head, right? Are you with me? Hello. Okay, just making sure you're still with me. All right. So here we have... And then there's a fourth thing. There's a group of people in chapter 3, verse 2. They're called dogs. Beware of dogs. Now, they didn't have a problem with German shepherds and Rottweilers running loose. They had a problem with false teachers coming in, and they were referenced as being like dogs. Now, to you and I, a dog is kind of a positive thing, right? Because we got a dog, and dogs are man's best friends, and cats are, they're growing on me. 
I must confess, I, I, they're growing on me. I, at, many, many years ago, I thought they were only good with noodles and rice. <laughs> I woke you up now, didn't I? And now I'm beginning to see they're actually pretty good. They don't bark. They don't whine. You can leave them for extended periods of time. They're pretty good. Ladies are like a husband, you know. Anyhow, and so, just kidding, just joking, just joking. Leave, feed them and keep them happy and he'll be all right. But uh, nonetheless, that expression, dogs, that wasn't negative. They're dogs, man. Get that stuff out of here. So don't, don't, let me tell you something. There's a lot of dogs running around the world today, and that's a biblical term. There's a lot of people that are steering folks away from the Lord and from truth, and that's dog behavior. That's not good. That's mongrel behavior, and the Lord's not pleased with that. Jesus in his day referenced a group of people as being a generation of vipers, right? Negative connotation there. And so this letter is written to this group of people who are a giving, serving people. They're being thanked. They've sent somebody. There's clarification there. There's also some instruction there about functioning and getting along with each other. And there's caution against false teaching coming in. That sounds pretty common, doesn't it? You know that these were people who were subject to like passions as we are. They lived at a different time and they lived in a different place. But you understand that men and women They've had the same issues. We've dealt with the same problems regardless of the time or the culture that we've lived in. You don't think that Adam and Eve had problems just like people today have problems? You don't know that dealing with their kids, you don't know that they had heartache and heartbreak. Can you imagine when it came out, what had taken place with their son raising up in anger and killing his brother? You don't think that broke their heart? No, and his family, these people had problems like we do. Their life experience, their human experience in some ways different and how God was working with them and revealing himself to them. But same problems. And so I come to this letter as I opened up with getting that box of letters out and hearing this son write home or seeing a father write to a son or looking back at letters that I've written and say, okay, what's this letter got for me? What's in this to help me? So the Apostle Paul addresses them, and he reminds them of who they are, and he's thankful, he's mindful of them, he tells them he's praying for them. And then he tells them, hey, I need you to know something. I need you to know that I'm in bonds. Can you imagine how somebody who would be working against the Apostle Paul would come after Paul is in jail and say something like this to him? You see what happened to Paul, don't you? He's in jail. He's sitting in prison. He must be a bad person. You don't follow what he said. There must be something bad about that. Now look, you're living today in a society that's flipped. You're living today where people might say about gospel and truth and the word of God. That's narrow-minded. That's bigoted. You can't believe that. You can't say that. You can't think that way. Look at the and there's there is an all-out attack on truth. On truth. To turn truth into a liar, to falsehood, that doesn't change truth. Your opinion of truth doesn't change truth. Truth remains the same, right? If you say, I can walk through walls, I'd like to see you. Go ahead. We'll wait. We'll wait for you, okay? We'll wait for that to happen. It's not going to happen. Someday in your resurrected body you will, but you're not walking through walls right now. But you say, I believe it. Well, believe it. Keep believing it. Keep going at it. Doesn't change it. Truth is truth. Truth is timeless. And truth is what, and what is truth? Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. You can see where people would come in and try to pull people away from Paul and more, for, more so from Christ and from the gospel. And so Paul says, I need to explain something to you. I want you not to have a wrong opinion of why I'm in bonds. I want you to know that I'm in bonds for a reason. These are Christ's bonds. The Lord has put me in jail. I'm in jail. I'm under bondage here. I believe later on in the chapter, he will send a greeting and conclusion from all the saints that are in the household of Caesar. I believe that he is now under Roman authority, and he finds himself somewhat locked in and confined. And he says to them, this has happened for a purpose. And he said, let me tell you the benefit of me being in bonds, because you may feel sorry for me, you may look at this and say, I don't want to follow that if that's what's going to happen to me. I don't want to follow him. He must be wrong. I'm here because Christ put me, Paul said. He put me in these bonds. And furthermore, my bonds have fallen out to be a greater blessing to people than they are a negative. You see, the Bible says, look at it with me, would you please? Verse 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. 
The Apostle Paul said, listen, I'm in bonds, and here's what it's doing. It's having an adverse effect against the enemy. It's causing other people to speak up. Don't you know when Daniel got thrown into the lion's den and he came out and he was not harmed, not hurt, and then his enemies were tossed in? Don't you know that when people saw Daniel coming, his testimony was now magnified by the victory that God brought in his life. How about the Hebrew children? When they went into the fiery furnace, the fiery furnace, it was turned up, and not a hair, not a garment, not even the smell of smoke was on their clothes, but those soldiers that threw them in were burned up. Don't you know that the Lord established through persecution his power and his authority in their life? Paul said, listen, you may not like it, you may not want it, but this is what God has for me to be in bonds, and this is how I see it. They're the Lord's bonds, and they're emboldening people. And regardless, and I'm not going through all of it, he says there's several verses there, regardless of whether people are preaching it because of contention, they're preaching against me or they're preaching for me, it has created the conversation about Christ and the preaching of Christ, and Christ is exalted and the gospel is declared, and I glory in that. See it with me, please. Verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be what? Let's say it again. So that what? Now, so now also Christ shall be magnified. Magnified. Hey, last Sunday morning we said, are you a roadblock? Are you a stumbling block? Are you a building block? How to get the mindset of a building block? How to get that, you know, we talk sometimes about having the winner's edge and the runner's edge and the champion's edge. How to get the mindset of a building block. I don't know of any person short of the Lord Jesus Christ written in Scripture about. I'm sure there are people who have lived that I will never meet until I get to glory. But in the Scripture, you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody who was the building block that the Apostle Paul was where people could follow him, where people could build upon his testimony, watch him, and having a heart for people and going to people. There he is, and now you're seeing, you say, listen, I'm in chains, and that's all right, because Christ is exalted, and for me, I want my life to be this, that Christ would be magnified. What's a magnifying glass do? It takes something that's little and does what? Makes it big. What's a microscope do? How about a telescope? It takes that thing that seems so far off and it brings it close. When you magnify something, and by the way, Jesus is no small letter. Jesus is no small star. He's plenty all in of himself, but when we magnify him through our life, we bring that one who seemingly is so far off, we bring him near to people and we say, hey, my desire, my goal, my objective, my heartbeat is that Christ would be what? Magnified, making much of Jesus, making much of his gospel message, making much of salvation today. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then we take the microphone and we speak to you and we magnify the volume. We speak to you today of Christ and of his goodness, of his love, of his uh, laying down his life for you, of the salvation that's available to you, and we magnify that. What do you magnify in your life? So oftentimes we magnify our problems. So oftentimes we magnify our grievances. So oftentimes when people come to know us and they're around us, Christ is not magnified. The Word of God is not magnified. We are. Our victories, our failures, our problems, our concerns, all about me. Well, what we ought to do is what? Magnify Jesus. In that matter of unity, who is magnified when there's a lack of unity in your home? Who's magnified? Who's magnified in our church when Christ is not the one that unites us and draws us in? Who gets the attention then? I don't want to spend any more of my life talking about things that don't matter in light of eternal view. I want to spend my time magnifying Jesus and magnifying him in our ministry. The Apostle Paul says, listen, I'm in bonds. Don't fret it. Don't dread it. Don't worry about me. It's what the Lord has for me, and the Lord is using that. By the way, the Lord uses your testimony. He uses your problems. He uses your setbacks when he brings victory to your life, when he brings a settling to your life in a new direction. He's magnified. Notice verse 21. So from that mindset of what? Being magnified, letting Christ be magnified in our body, whether it be by what? 
Life or by death. It means if I live and he's magnified, I'm thrilled. If he puts me to death, if I die at a martyr's death and he's magnified, that's what's in it. I want that. I want whatever he wants. I want whatever make Jesus look bigger and better to everybody else. Verse 21. And then we come, and this is kind of one of those verses that just jumps out at us, doesn't it? For to me to live is what? And to die is, now this is not an nihilistic perspective. You and I are not to walk around in life saying, oh, I wish I could die today. I hope I could die. There's a lot of stuff going on, and I think the reality, there are some people who are more disposed to that way of thinking. They, they get discouraged, they get frustrated. Look, some folks, I've known people who were uh, on up in years, and they were dealing with health problems, and Problems in their life, physical problems. Well, I just wish the Lord would take me to heaven. There's nothing wrong with desiring to go to heaven as long as you don't lose sight of the fact that you're here. And you're here until He calls you home. And while you're here, He's to be magnified. He's to be magnified through your persecution. He's to be magnified through your problems. He's to be magnified through poor health. He's to be magnified through troublesome times, whatever it is that's going around us. He's to be magnified, and we're to recognize it. You see, so often, and I'm not belabored because I feel like it's a current theme, an ongoing theme with me, but so oftentimes when we say, for me to live is, what's your answer? For me to live is a bigger home. For me to live is a new car. For me to live is clothes. For me to live is retirement. For me to live is vacation. For me to live is fun. For me to live is the next thrill. For me to live is, and so oftentimes it's everything but for me to live is Christ. Amen. Oh, I don't stand before you today and say, I've got it figured out and that I'm perfect at it. I'm pressing towards that same mark. I believe that that mark that we're pressing toward is that expression that he would be magnified and is summed up in that. I'm pressing towards the mark for me to live is Christ. I want every day and every moment, every opportunity, every word, every thought, every intent of my heart to be brought into that captivity. Christ, Christ, Christ. All for Jesus, all to Jesus, the songwriter said. I surrender all to him, I humbly give. Hey, young people, let me help you make the greatest decision of your life. That's not to say I'm going to serve God here, I'm going to serve God there. It's just simply to say I want my expression of life to be my life is Christ. For me to live is Christ. Boy, if we would all bring ourselves under that and to be directed by that and bring our hearts into that, as we're his servants, and for me to live as Christ, that means when we wake up, like little Samuel, who was ministering for Eli as his mother Hannah had taken to the house of the Lord. And whatever Eli needed, Samuel was there to help. One night, Samuel thought he heard the voice of Eli, and he jumped right up, and he said, Yes, sir, what is it that you need? Eli said, It wasn't me. Go back to bed. Samuel was laying there in bed, and he heard it again. He heard his name. And what did he do? He didn't roll over and ignore it. He jumped up and he went in again and said, yes, sir, what is it that you need me to do? And that time, you remember, Eli figured out it was the Lord calling him. And he said, listen, next time, don't come to me, go to the Lord. Yes, Lord, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. For me to live is Christ. It's like the mother who's tired and weary, and she's carried that little one in her womb for those nine months. And that little one is delivered, and there she's gone through perhaps one of the most complicated, difficult times of her human life, her human experience. And what does she ask? She doesn't say, take the baby and bring it back to me in six months. She says, please bring the baby to me and let me hold the baby. And what a beautiful picture, and I'll be very careful, what a beautiful picture it is to see a woman who's just gone through all that suffering to carry that child and then to birth that child. And then to take that very child and bring it close to her and begin to nourish that child and care for that child. Because for that mother, for me to live is that baby right then and right there. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is Him. What do you need, Lord? What are your, what's your direction? What's your call? What's your purpose? Paul said, Lord, you want me to be in prison? Okay. You want me to be in bonds? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I don't have time to read all of it, but it's a listing of all the things that the apostle Paul went through, shipwrecked and in perils, distressed and perplexed and dealing with those things that are without and dealing with those things that are within. And the apostle Paul said, it's okay. I'll do it and I'll gladly do it. For me to live is? Amen. 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 For me to live is Christ. 
But notice this, and to die is, what are you afraid of? What's the number one fear of man? I think it, statistically it bears out that man, natural man, fears death. We do all we can to extend it. I'm not opposed to that. You ought to take care of yourself. It's all right. You imagine a day if somebody really truly did find the fountain of youth? People would be lining up, wouldn't they? May I say to you that I have found something far greater than the fountain of youth? I found, as the hymn writer would find, say it, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I'm not offering you another hundred years. Jesus is offering to you eternal, everlasting life. That is much, much better. And where are the masses? Where are the people in line for something far greater? Boy, can you imagine if God allowed you to live 300 years here on this earth? God's merciful when he gives you, it says, I'm going to give you 80 years, and then if you get some more than that, well, that's good. But let's face it, you want 300 years of this? Can you imagine what kind of shape you'd be in 300 years from now? I'm seeing you right now, and we're not <laughs> 300. I'm scared, man. God's merciful in that, right? But people don't want to die. And I'm not looking to get my ticket punched today. I'm not standing here saying, Lord, I'm, take me next, right? But I'm not afraid of it. For me to live is Christ and to die is... There is so much more waiting for the believer who loves the Lord, who's called according to his purpose, who looks forward to seeing Jesus. Maybe you fear that as a believer because right now you know that there's stuff in your life that needs to be resolved and cared for and made better and be strengthened. You don't want to be like that man in the Gospel of Luke who went to hell and in hell... He said, give me a drop of water. Can't do that. He said, okay, would you do me a favor? Would you do something that I should have done? Would you tell my brothers about this place? You see, that, that guy had a better perspective of, e of eternity than you and I do. He wanted to warn people. You and I ought to be warning people and pointing people to Jesus, pointing them to Jesus. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let me get to the message now. Verse 23. For I am in a what? A strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And I will not rush it. I really, that was my introduction, and it took longer than I anticipated. If you'll come back tonight, we'll pick up right here on this, and we'll understand this verse right here and what these words reference, the strait and to depart and what that's all about and how living for Christ and what that looks like. And I think it'll be a help to us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we? Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the word of God, the power that's in the word, the power of the gospel. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Today we've introduced you to the book of Philippians, and we've spent some time considering that. We've looked to lift up Christ and the gospel. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm not going to embarrass you. But if I did, if I came to every person in this room, if I brought the microphone and I said, please stand up and explain to everybody here that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and what that's all about, could you today? Could you, as the Lord would use the Apostle Paul to say in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I could stand right now and tell you when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I know what happened. Nobody has to tell me. I don't have to look for it anywhere. That's something that took place between myself and the Lord when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as that jailer did in that city of Philippi that we referenced a few moments ago. When you believed on the Lord as your Savior, in your heart you believed and with your mouth there was that confession, there was that calling of your heart, Lord, save me. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I do not know for sure if I were to die today that heaven would be my home. I do not know that I have that life, everlasting, eternal life that you spoke of, but I want to. I don't want to just be religious. I don't want to just be a churchgoer. I want to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to know that scriptural term, saved. I want to know that that's mine, that I am saved. Who's here this morning and say, Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that. I don't know for sure that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Please pray for me, Pastor. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that today? Say, Preacher, I, I don't know that. I'd like to know that. Let me tell you that in this room today, there are men, there are women who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they would be so thrilled and they would be rejoicing with you to help you to come to that understanding and that knowledge of Christ. Not just head knowledge, 
but that heart and believing on him. Who's here this morning and say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. Would you lift your hand? If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm saved, but as I put my life to that test, for me to live is, I don't know. The Apostle Paul was willing to go through imprisonment and bonds and beatings, and whether he lived or died, he just wanted the Lord to be magnified. Friend, when we bring our lives into inspection of that, does the Spirit speak to your heart? Does he call to you to greater service and greater surrender? If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, there was something in that for me. My heart is stirred in my direction towards my Savior. Please pray for me, Preacher. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that today? Several hands. Here in just a moment, we'll have an invitation. We'll invite you to use the altar if you were to come today and do business with the Lord. If you'd like for somebody to pray with you. If this morning you're not sure that you're saved, there are people who'd be glad to meet with you. I've got men here at the altar ready to pray and help any way they can. There are ladies that are available as well. Whatever your need may be today, I trust that you'll respond to the leadership of the Lord. Let's stand on our feet, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm asking our pianist to play now, and she is. And